Working with people isn't just about hiring the right person, you still need to manage the project and collaborate to get the most out of your investment. Just because something is a project doesn't mean you should get it ticked off and done. You've invested in your business and you should get what you've paid for. And yes, we want to enjoy working with people, but the people pleasing needs to be dialed in right. This is the third and final episode in a series about hiring and managing your marketing hires. Outsourcing of marketing isn't always super simple, but these episodes are here to give you a starting point to get you maybe halfway through figuring out how to make this work for you. This episode is particularly about managing those hires. I talk a little bit about the basics of delegating tasks, gaining trust on both sides, but also ways to empower and grow the relationship even further and how to adapt the role over time. I also want to pause now and share that if you aren't at a point of hiring, you shouldn't feel like you're behind. Your business size is not indicative of your value. It can still be beneficial to think about this and listen to what others have to say so that you can learn from their hindsight. That shouldn't serve as a yardstick to judge yourself by how quickly you can expand your business in this way. In marketing, but also in business, we are wanting to maximize your profit. So if you can make bank while working solo, that's fantastic. If you can benefit from having a VA or an online business manager or people who do billable work for you and you have the budget to make it happen, hire away. In these three episodes, I'll be sharing my knowledge and experience, but also the experience of three guests I've had on the show before. Alison Haynes, patent maker of Alison Haynes Design and host of the Halfitting podcast. Michelle Winterstein, the brand designer and creative director of MKW Creative Co. and podcast host of Kiss My Aesthetic. And Rachel Anderson, interior designer of Aurora Interiors. Creating a team environment starts with you. You might want to grow a team that allows you to take time off and work with people that are empowered to do their work and not rely on you for every single task. That starts with delegating and sharing information with them so they feel like they know everything about their role and the tasks they need to complete for you. Over time, they'll grow and hopefully your business keeps up with them and you manage to grow together. How you onboard your team, either on a one-on-one basis or with documents you reuse with everyone will change depending on your team, whether you're replacing people or creating new roles and how many projects you have on the go. As your team grows, you can delegate this process, even asking your team to make their own upgraded versions of how-to documents and being more involved in evolving your marketing strategy. Michelle shared that it's important to be patient with new hires, to have high standards but low expectations to start and build trust over time. Realistically, it can take a while to find that rhythm of outsourcing as a whole and them doing the individual tasks. Maintaining your standards can be an exercise in patience and persistence, but you have to start somewhere. Part of that improvement is giving feedback so that people can adjust and better align with what you want or need. Sometimes it can seem simpler to take a project back over and redo the work yourself, but this is only a short-term solution. Explaining why you want something adjusted can go a long way in helping those you work with to adapt and better predict what you would prefer. You might also find that training or some other skill development needs to be done, and that's a normal way of improving the team's performance. It's a little different if it's a project and they're a contractor, so there's limits, but it's something to consider. If you're cautious to hand off tasks or are new to outsourcing, it can help to start small, consistently handing things off over a longer amount of time. Once you grow that trust with the people you outsource to, you can start to delegate those items that you have more particular preferences for. It takes time to not only trust that the person can get the task done well enough that it's okay you're not doing it, but also for you to get used to articulating what you need. Sometimes you just have to give something a try and see how they do, but getting to know them is also a fantastic way to grow that trust. Back in the first part of this mini-series, I spoke about understanding the boundaries before you choose what to hire for. Now it might be time to implement some or for someone to set boundaries with you. If you want more done, you can ask to expand the scope of the project when you request a task. Getting specific and saying, I know this is outside the scope, so please quote this for me, to communicate that respect more explicitly instead of forcing them to take on the mental labor of bringing it up with you. Rachel shared that she always tries to group tasks, trying not to send emails with one thing at a time, so she'll share a list of at least three to five items to complete per email. Being a good colleague or a client is mostly about communicating clearly, but then doing what you say you'll do. When you say you'll do something, whether it actually gets done shows your true intentions. The same goes for your hire, but there's a power dynamic at play in these relationships. This showing up and doing what you say you will do is the beginning to building and earning trust since you expect the same from them. There is also a case to be made for constant communication and verbal reviewing together so that things don't go unsaid, at least as often. It can sometimes seem easier to take what you've learned and start fresh by working with someone new instead of working through it with your existing contractor or whoever. 
It's just simply not that cut and dry because you might end up in the same situation again. On the flip side, there is sometimes that sunk cost fallacy where you stick with something that's not working because you don't want to start again when you've spent so much time and money on something. You'll never get to a level where that balance is just easy, unfortunately. So you might need to figure out what your natural inclination is to resist it a little bit, but not too much. Alison has found it's best to focus on the outcome, not the exact process. She shared that she's detailed, but doesn't want to micromanage even though she has done that work in the past. Rachel shared that she needed to learn when or how to trust them to come up with the best option. She likes to give her team a chance to do it their way first so they can best anticipate what she'll need in the future. Responsibilities will be written in detail in the scope of your work or a job description you write, but KPIs are how you keep things on track. KPIs are key performance indicators. They're how you dictate whether the person you've hired is doing a good job and creating a positive impact for the business. For every item they're responsible for, you could probably set five different versions of a KPI, but each of those would funnel their focus in a different direction. Don't leave this up to them since they might go for something you wouldn't necessarily want or simply coast through something simple. You'll have the KPI and the goal relating to that set for a certain period of time and adjust by checking in regularly. You're not necessarily micromanaging, but you're holding them accountable to keep making improvements even when things are going well. If the requirement is to post to Facebook three times a week and no one's looking at the indicators that tell you that no one is seeing the posts, you're not going to realize people have moved on to Instagram or TikTok or the audience just doesn't find the content that you're sharing interesting. There are businesses out there who currently have a social media coordinator and they genuinely use a tactic everyone else retired in 2015 because it wasn't doing it anymore. However, if their performance is judged on volume, they're technically doing the job. So at a point, it becomes the manager's responsibility to reroute how the work is done and judged. Again, you don't have to do the figuring out, but having regular check-ins and reporting with benchmarks helps things to not slip out of control. While KPIs are important to check in on during a more formal review meeting, you also want to keep on top of everything in between those reviews. I love a dashboard for this, being able to see where all projects are up to and how certain indicators are performing. Because I use Notion, I love using the progress indicator option on any number field where I'm using the table view of a database. You might have delegated the core responsibilities of something, but having a certain volume of something that forces a discussion can be important too. Say you're tracking your open rate on your email newsletters. Your team might be responsible for improving that and making sure that the list size grows so it gets that work off of your mind and you can focus on something else. But then you set a minimum amount where if that open rate dropped below X percent, you'd have to have a meeting and get involved. If you're working with a contractor, your check-ins will be a little less formal than a performance review, but it's still important to share with those you work with that you care about certain metrics or outcomes and agree how you're tracking communicate about them. It's also good to discuss how you can hold each other accountable, whether you'll set deadlines and how you'll give each other feedback. At a certain point, you need to determine the success of the hire or whether the project was worth it. You can use your KPIs to check this by comparing them to the investment. If you're working with an employee or even an ongoing contractor, I genuinely like a performance review structure. It isn't always fun, certainly doesn't sound fun, but transparency and structure are so much more simpler than the unknown. If things are ambiguous and communication isn't happening, expectations go unsaid. If there's some negative feedback to share, it shouldn't be a surprise in a performance review. The companies where people hate performance reviews are the ones that deliver surprises in them. They should already know all about anything like that. Instead, you'll want to talk about how they can move up in the company, get a pay rise, or advance to a new job title. That might not happen within the next year or six months, depending on how often you have these conversations. But you could start with parts of their job that they could be faster at or take more initiative in, or how they could warrant that pay rise, regardless of whether they're pushing for one. The best employees are the ones you keep for a long time because they know the company, your offer, how you operate, and why you do the things you do. They can operate well on a calm day, but they can also hoist a mainstream in a storm. My mum has always told me something she used to say to clients when they'd talk about training their team and investing because she's an accountant. They'd say what if I pay for their training and they leave and she would say something along the lines of what if you don't and they stay. Depending on who they've worked for before people aren't always as upfront to ask but broaching the subject can kickstart that conversation. The other issue is when the business doesn't allow for feedback back up the chain including skip reviews where you can share feedback more anonymously about the manager because a third party is running the feedback portion. In a small business that might be harder but where it's possible that's great. 
By reviewing where you'd want them to be skill-wise in a year from now and how you're going to help them get there, you're supporting them and also setting an expectation. For their role, even if they work with you as an ongoing contractor, you want to plan how it could grow and expand or if there's extra tasks to outsource to them or something else. Part of working with a team is future planning, not only for yourself and the company, but for the individual employee so that they can continue to grow with you. By upskilling both your team and yourself, you can better keep up with the shifts in marketing. Michelle works with her team by asking them what they love doing, what they hate doing, and what's something they'd like to outsource to someone else to support them. She works with them whittling down what they're good at to get to their specific skill set and supplementing the rest. So she's able to work with multiple people to find the best fit for everyone. By getting to know them, what they enjoy about their work and what motivates them, you can better look for new responsibilities and projects for them. Michelle also hosts weekly one-on-one check-ins and weekly team meetings, giving them opportunities to volunteer for the projects they want to work on instead of assuming or assigning out work without conversation. These check-ins can also teach you more about how long projects take, opportunities to upsell clients or create new offerings or areas where your team could grow their skill set. Rachel shared that she tries to make sure her flow aligns with theirs. If there's any system or way of thinking that is best for them, she hopes they know they are working as a team. She's received feedback from consultants before on formatting and she said it was super helpful. Project management is so much more than the tools you use to track tasks. It's planning, prioritizing, setting expectations, keeping everyone in the loop, recalibrating and keeping things moving regardless of what else is going on around that one project. That said, the tools that help you keep track of all the components are pretty important. Allison prefers Trello boards or with due dates. Michelle has weekly deliverables in Basecamp but also uses project templates and has benefited from learning what her capacity is and trying not to overbook. Rachel relies heavily on deadlines, saying it works well for both parties when they agree on a deadline and don't back out of it. So basically, the consensus is deadlines and tracking in some way. Things happen, but nothing happens when you don't have a date to work towards. This is also so true for all those projects where you could continue working on it forever and never launch it. A deadline is what makes those projects finish. I love a system, so more than a software, I like to keep things simple and make everything accessible. That means I love a dashboard, so I can look at one place and keep my finger on the pulse of everything that's going on. The less I have to verbally go through it all with everyone I'm working with or keep all the things I'm working on in my head, the better. If you were to choose to expand your work, you might be able to choose something that isn't necessarily one of the packages you originally chose from. This might be because they can now tailor it to you or because time has passed and how they create packages may have evolved anyway. Over time, their pricing will certainly change. Have a chat with them and hopefully they're excited to expand their work with you too. Sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes only because you don't extend after the initial contract. Other times you just don't need that role filled anymore. My clients graduate from working with me at some point. Now that's at the end of a package. Package. But back when I was working on Retainer, it made sense that eventually some clients hired someone in-house that eventually took over the management I was doing. That's what we want. It means the business is growing. Am I sad to see them go? Only a little, because I'm mostly just happy for them. A lot of this comes down to communication. When you are able to discuss any minor hurdles, you can better understand how each other operate. Too many times I have seen someone not say anything about the small things and surprise the person they've been communicating with when those small issues suddenly snowball into a big clash. When you do communicate and give that person an option to change something, they might also give you an option to adjust how you work. This wouldn't usually happen unprompted because it would be an out of left field option and over time that had become overwhelming. Unsolicited options would be weird. It doesn't have to be a confrontation, but raising something as a point of discussion or a preference or simply as a question can often be much more productive than pretending the resentment doesn't exist. In some instances, it's not even a work problem that needs to be raised. I've had clients pause working with me when a major life event happened, either affecting their ability to take part in the service or because there's simply no point in running ads when our objective is to book calls, but they've closed off their calendar for the near future. Our businesses don't exist in a vortex, so things happen, either in society where it's a shared event or personally. Even shared events impact different businesses in different ways, so leaving things unsaid is just plain confusing. You might like to create a bit of a process around check-ins and celebrations. I spoke with Jolinda a little bit about this in her episode, which I'll link in the show notes. I personally love an offboarding email as the one being hired. Sometimes a document or a video is attached, but I just like to draw that line in the sand while also giving them everything they need for the near future. I do keep things open and that they can reach out to me whenever, but limiting the reasons why they would need to is 
so much more convenient for both of us. It also makes it clear that anything from here on out will be done in a different way and be a separate project while also informing them how that would work. If this doesn't happen for you, don't be afraid to ask for anything you'll need. What that is will be relevant to the work they're doing. So I won't run through a checklist with you here, but things like access to files and understanding where everything is up to or located is a great place to start. You can refer to your package or job description to check through or any onboarding documentation to essentially backtrack. As the one hiring for the project, you'll want to make sure you're offboarded fully. Do you have everything you paid for? Do you have everything in all the formatted sizing you'll need? Do you know whether you can work with them more in the future and how? How can you share a testimonial or make a referral? You'll be able to reach out, but you never know what will happen and whether people have a shift in business or a tech issue and can't access your files. So it's best to make sure you have everything up front. Getting everything out of your head and fully documented can take some of the mental load off. You might want to create a wiki or a stack of standard operating procedures of how to do most of the work you do. While you create version one, you can delegate keeping these up to date. Whether you record videos, write instructions, canned emails to copy and paste, create a checklist for quality control, or use a tool like Tango, this takes away the mental load and grows the collective information you have at your fingertips for future team members. I love an onboarding packet. It can include a little bit of information about how the employment pieces work, including how to request time off, as well as asking them to complete a form so you have their home address if they're remote and their emergency contact information. You might choose to create a company guideline document, including dress code, hours, and put all those tiny expectations that would otherwise be left unsaid and assumed as common. It gives you something to refer back to as well as a collective understanding. It might even include how team members can check whether others have time off booked and for when. When you're working with contractors or with someone on a project, you might instead choose to let them know when you'll be available and how you'll be communicating. You might choose to not communicate via text or have a specific work number or stick to email. You'll also want to have and keep updated a brand guidelines document. This pairs with your logo and content and breaks down how they should be used. For every ongoing team member, whether they're an employee or a contractor, you'll want to document their role and your expectations. This is what you'll base a review off of, so you'll want it to be specific. For projects, I love to add a little check-in time on my calendar for each deadline and to check I have everything and it's all on track so that I have a really clear line in the sand of when I should be chasing up something if I don't have it. You might want to review how you keep track of everything and if an analytics dashboard could work for you depending on your team size and their roles and how it would be populated. Managing and growing your team will always be a constant evolution, but when you're mostly on the same page and moving in the same direction, business just becomes better. Marketing isn't all that different, it's just that there is more commonly an imbalance where you might hire someone who has experience you don't have. So there's extra dynamics of accountability. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Digital Hive podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast, I'd love it if you could share it with a friend or on Instagram and tag me at Honeypot Digital. To find out more about Honeypot Digital and the work I do, or to find more episodes of the podcast and handy tips for small businesses marketing online, head to honeypotdigital.com.